everyone, and welcome back to another university segment of the Reimagine 2020 virtual conference. This is part two of our virtual conference series with the theme Disrupting the System. And today I'm interviewing Mitchell Moose. He's the editor in chief at Crypto Briefing, and I know him as the founder of the University of Washington Blockchain Society. Uh, started that back in 2017. For anyone who may have missed our last series. Uh, Mitchell also joined us for a panel called Breaking into Blockchain, where we interviewed four or five uh, former Mouse Belt students who have now moved on from college and, and gotten jobs in the blockchain space. So uh, encourage everybody to head over to YouTube and check that panel out. Really great tips and advice and, and experiences from students who uh, got interested in blockchain in college and went on to get jobs in the space. So uh, editor-in-chief of Crypto Briefing, Mitchell, how's it going today? Hey, Ashley, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So uh, we did talk a bit about your experience uh, on campus uh, as a student last series. So we wanted to invite you back again and maybe talk a little bit more about uh, what's the day-to-day -day of your job like? Um, how's it been going at Crypto Briefing? Uh, the day-to-day -day of my job is sitting on different Discord channels and watching uh, watching information coming in from lots of different projects. So it's usually just consuming a lot of information, trying to keep up to date with what the most recent theories are from a few of the top researchers in, in, in the industry and just reading up a lot. So it's... Uh, it's like Twitter on steroids. <laughs> Twitter on steroids. So I'm just super interested in, uh, you know, crypto news journalism. I've always been a real fan of, of journalism. I consume a lot of news media myself. And now with Mouse Belt kind of moving into the media space, conducting all these in interviews with industry leaders and trying to keep our pulse on what's interesting and what people want to know about. Um, what are some trends that you're seeing? What are what are people really interested in reading? Um, what kind of reporting is your uh, outlet really focused on? So, I mean, it's hard to deny that right now you're seeing a lot of activity in the DeFi space, so decentralized finance. And that has really just popped off in the last, I'm going to say, seven weeks where it has started to intensify. And right now, I'm seeing that as characteristics of a short-term bubble. So this really feels like the ICO days of 20, late 2017, early 2018 when it comes to DeFi. But that's just what people are talking about. It's the latest fad in crypto. Um, that's definitely something we've noticed as well. And, and I actually wasn't in the blockchain space uh, until 2018. So I missed the last, you know, big bear market, you would say, or this, this uh, ICO craze. Um, but people who have been in the space a little longer than me, um, when you pay attention to the ways people are talking about things, when you have your finger on the pulse, especially as like a news media outlet where you're really tuning in to what people are saying and how they're talking about it, uh, you can start to see uh, historical trends and, and it sounds like um, maybe you're picking up on a lot of the same kind of uh, uh, attention and, and the ways that people are talking about DeFi is reminding you of, of the 2017 ICO craze. Yeah, so I, I'm going to temper that and say that there, there definitely is some value there. However, um, it's not commensurate with the valuations and how much money people are putting into these totally untested and unaudited protocols. So there's oftentimes as a journalist and someone who believes in blockchain, I'm always at, at a conflict here where I see this really promising technology, but I, I find it hard to justify the valuations that, that they're trading at and the kinds of people who, who are making these big bets on these things. So it's, it's that, that part's definitely challenging. Um, did you happen to cover like the YAM protocol uh, stuff that went down? Yeah, we were some of the first people to cover that. And is that just from, you know, staying tuned in on Twitter or uh, these Discord channels? Uh, part of it is, but really I have to give credit to my team. Um, we have a team of some of the, our journalists are, are people who don't come from journalism backgrounds. Typically they're people who are in finance or they're former software engineers, and, and they're the kinds of people that use this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. So unlike 
some other publications where the journalists are actively discouraged from holding significant holdings of cryptocurrency, we tell our people to go out there and actually try it and use it and, and see if there's real value there. Absolutely. So, so you just get a, a whole other layer of industry knowledge in the reporting. Um, speaking of, uh, your background wasn't in journalism either, was it? No, no. Uh, journalism was kind of an accident. Uh, so with a, with a lot of people coming into crypto briefing who aren't necessarily journalists, uh, how do you uh, kind of get them up to speed or uh, evaluate their writing or um, kind of get them to, you know, not editorialize too much or be more objective? You know, I think there's a lot of principles to journalism that, you yeah. know, you can you can learn or, or some people might just be naturally good at. Um, what's your strategy for kind of taking these uh, finance people and turning them into reporters? Well, um, teaching people how to write is a lot easier than teaching them hard skills in, in terms of analysis. And the very first thing that we do is before we bring anyone on, I make sure that I look at their full track record. And we typically don't hire anyone who doesn't have published work out there. But if someone is trying to break into the space and they have a well-developed blog or something, then it's going to be a lot easier for me to, to evaluate um, how objective they can write and, and what are their areas and in interests and what are their strengths. So I would say that the main things that I'm looking for is someone who loves cryptocurrency and, and actively uses it and is able to scrutinize it. So people who are actually both skeptical and optimistic simultaneously is, is what I like to see. And then if, if they do have a keen interest in it, that they're, they're writing regularly about it already. And yeah. Well, you would hope that uh, people who actually care about the space also care about looking at it objectively and, and scrutinizing it so that it can be the best ecosystem possible. Um, so as far as um, not necessarily having a bias because they are interested in cryptocurrency or they believe in the technology, um, maybe actually are motivated uh, to, to hold it to a higher standard so that it can be the best it can be. Yeah, that's one of the differentiators for crypto briefing is we're one of the few publications who's willing to go out and criticize different projects for under delivering or or for being overvalued and we're one, also one of the few publications where if we do have a trading heavy or technical analysis heavy piece we'll actually issue sell recommendations so we're we're <laughs> we're okay now to hold people to a higher standard because we think that most of the publications in the space are consistently over optimistic and bear on and bullish on the technology and that kind of bias is just easier to report on because you don't need to do as much due diligence when you're saying just nice things about projects right um so then would you recommend to any students out there who might be interested in getting into journalism um they have an interest in cryptocurrency uh that they don't necessarily have to be a journalism major but they do need to be writing a lot so just get get their content out there, um, follow the trends closely, and um, you guys hire mostly freelancers or um, some full-time staff? Oh, it's not. So everyone in our organization starts out as a freelancer. I started out as a freelancer. And what I also like about crypto briefing is, is I've been able to shape the publication so that it is completely meritocratic. So we don't pay people per word, it's based upon like the sources and the kind of content that they put out. Um, everyone gets paid equally. So it doesn't matter if you're based out of Siberia or India or San Francisco Bay, you're going to get paid the same as everybody else. Um, and if, if you demonstrate that you're valuable to the organization and you actually are hungry to be reporting and trying to break um, stories that no one else is doing, then we're going to hire you into the organization as a full timer. Awesome. Well, so there's a, a, a great insight into the career path uh, to crypto briefing. Um, curious as to some of your thoughts as far as, um, you know, negative or positive media attention, mainstream media attention. I know I've talked to students, um, for example, in Australia, and they've expressed that in Australia, there's a particularly negative conception of crypto. And um, just what kind of the responsibility is of people within the space, people in media to dispel those myths. Uh, last week, we did a, a debate uh, with the Mouse Belt University students just kind of talking about was the Twitter hack good or bad for Bitcoin? Because here was a moment, right, where everybody heard about Bitcoin that day yeah. because it was such a big hack. And it was just funny to see 
that the articles that I kind of pulled to have people read to kind of talk about what, what is the public conversation right now for people to kind of develop arguments on either side. Um, the more negative headlines were from places like CNN, whereas, you know, Coindesk would say something like, um, you know, actually this proves Bitcoin's transparency and that it's not very good for crime because the hacker was caught pretty immediately, right? Um, do you see that, you know, uh, you know, what would just some of your thoughts about, you know, mainstream media, what crypto journalism can do, what our responsibilities are? Well, I think that uh, some of the negative coverage of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is warranted because if you look at this from the perspective of the general public, this is just some crazy internet money that a fringe group of gray market people and, and this really small cultish community of people are, are really pushing hard. And it's, it's fundamentally controversial. Bitcoin's here. It didn't exist prior to this because making your own money and issuing your own money was completely illegal. So... The fact, the very fact that Bitcoin exists is meant to kind of probe and challenge the authorities. And of course, people aren't going to like that. Definitely. Um, so started the blockchain club over at University of Washington, 2017, moved on to uh, build your career in the blockchain space. Uh, can you report back to people watching from all over the world? What is the state of blockchain education at University of Washington? What is the state of blockchain kind of in the wider Seattle region and, and also maybe the, the startup culture there? Oh, well, I mean, the UW Blockchain Society, we've done a lot to try to improve the education around blockchain at all of the UW campuses, so all three campuses. And there's definitely been a lot of progress because when I first started in 2017, no one really knew what was going on and there wasn't any information out there or any way to get connected to people who, who were in the space. Um, so I, I would say that there's definitely progress being made, but university years are slow, so I don't expect it to happen overnight. It might take two or three leadership transitions before there's substantive change. Um, when yeah, comes... I mean, it, it can take a, it can take up to five years sometimes for a university to accept a new accredited course. Exactly. So I'm, I mean, I'm not going to get my hopes up that they're going to change overnight, but I think that if the blockchain space continues to exist and if it continues demonstrating that there's real tangible value there, then the university system, as long as there's demand, will adapt eventually. Yeah, and uh, I just know from being involved with UW um, from the big, the inception of Mouse Belt University, you know, started by interviewing students and professors all over the U.S., trying to figure out what was the temperature of blockchain on campuses, saw some of the same things, you know, a lot of bureaucracy and, and, and universities being slow to respond to this, it's seemingly overwhelming demand from students. There's a lot of students asking for this education. Um, and the, their, their fellow students are stepping up and providing those educational opportunities. And, uh, you know, I traveled to Seattle, got to go to um, one of the conferences that the club hosted, and it was around the same time as the Pacific Northwest Blockchain Week. Um, so it was really fun to meet the community out there. And it seemed like there was a, a, a strong interest in blockchain. And I know that you've been doing or they've been doing um, you know, events with hundreds of people sponsored by Microsoft. So it seems like there's some momentum there. And I love the uh, idea of kind of forming an alliance with other state schools within the same system, right? There's the UW system, there's two other campuses, right? Um, so really encouraging other universities, you know, maybe the UT system in Texas, there's UT Dallas, UT Austin, you know, having some more of that cross campus collaboration to really strengthen the effort. Yeah, I think uh, collaborating is good. <laughs> well, uh, so last time we had you on the show, uh, we did a great panel with some other Mouse Belt students just talking about advice for breaking into blockchain. Uh, you know, we called the conference Reimagine because we wanted to take this kind of shelter in place orders and this moment of, of kind of being forced to pause and reflect and, and reimagine how we were going to move forward for the rest of the year. And it seems like the last three months, um, we've only seen more of our systems fail. Failed responses to the pandemic, uh, economic crises, uh, political strife at home and abroad, 
Uh, so we wanted this theme to be disrupting the system. Uh, so I wanted to hear from you, what are some blockchain use cases that you're most excited about uh, or that you think have the most potential to really change things up? Well, I think one of the primary use cases for blockchain is around financial assets. So, I mean, this is really the, the application that's blown up the most as we've seen from, from Bitcoin and to a lesser extent Ethereum. However, I think that there's obvious tangible value there because when you're able to have a base money that can function as a unit of account and a means of transferring value, then there's so many other things that, so many other doors that that opens up. Um, so I think things like fundraising, things like tokenization of, of real estate or different other assets, the ability to move capital around and invest in these securities, which were previously off limits to to both investors and the people fundraising. So there's a good and bad side to this. Like the ICO craze spun up just an enormous amount of fraud and speculation and, and froth. But at the same time, there's proof that the ICO is, is a viable model for some companies to actually raise funding outside of traditional VC channels or being able to raise funding from the public. So what I think is, um, it's definitely going to be disruptive. It's going to change. I don't know if it's going to be better or worse. So for example, I think that protecting investors, like retail investors, um, is something that's worthwhile. And the SEC should be doing that. But if they cannot do that, um, the technology allows it so that it's impractical to be regulating these fundraises, then um, how do you, where do you go from there? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, now let's just get back to basics, right? There's all sorts of discussions about what blockchain can do as far as supply chain or digital identity, but uh, the very base of it is just a digital currency that is uh, transferable and immutable. And that, that alone could really, is already starting to really disrupt our systems as we see more and more uh, countries with failed economies adopting Bitcoin and um, it's, it's obviously very disruptive because the powers that be uh, want to fight against it quite a bit. So uh, definitely looking forward to just like more adoption or, or, or the strengthening of just simple uh, digital currencies, especially, uh, you know, being able to take care of remittances and send money all over the world and to own your own money and, and decide when and how you spend it. Um, so before, before we wrap up, um, is there, would you like to share some more about some of the work that you do at Crypto Briefing? I know that uh, you wanted to maybe mention some of the research projects that you do. Yeah, so Crypto Briefing, we're one of the top, not just cryptocurrency publications, but we also have a substantial research division. And we also issue some of the, outside of like WIS ratings, we also issue asset grades for the different cryptocurrency projects. So we have just dozens of reports on, on cryptocurrency and blockchain investments. And a bar large part of what we do is have our team of analysts go in and try to assess and interview the team and actually dig deep into these projects and see whether they're A, overvalued, or B, um, if there's actually something there. So if you are someone who regularly is looking to invest in the cryptocurrency space, then go check out symmetry.cryptobriefing.com. Excellent. So you heard it here, folks. Um, for all of you investors out there, if you're looking for quality information, um, we just heard from Mitchell, the journalistic standards these guys have of really uh, taking hard looks at these projects and digging in um, a really uh, reliable source of information, uh, crypto briefing. Thank you again, Mitchell, for joining us. And we'll be back with more from Reimagine 2020. No, thank you. Hope you have a great day.